Okay, welcome back to the Boost Hospitality Podcast. This is a brand new season. This is season number six, episode one. And for this season, I wanted to do something a little bit different. And I wanted to talk about the world of serviced accommodation. So over the course of this series, you're going to find out everything that there is to know about serviced accommodation. First and foremost, what's it all about? Um, How to get started, the do's and don'ts of getting started, how to grow a service accommodation business, the differences between hospitality and service accommodation, and also how you can increase direct bookings for everybody in the world of service accommodation. So that's going to be the series. Uh, For episode one, I wanted to start right at the very start. And I wanted to go through in this episode and talk about what is serviced accommodation? How is it um, affecting the world of, of hospitality, hotels? And most importantly, just find out a little bit more for the people that are making a difference in this industry. So this season, compared to the other ones, um, I've got guests that are going to come in every single episode, and I'm going to speak to the people that are really making a difference in this industry. Today, um, we've got a gent called Jason Living who is coming on to this podcast. Uh, Jason has got a a long history with property and service accommodation. I'm going to let him introduce himself in a second. And we're going to go in and we're going to talk about uh, service accommodation and everything else that you need to know. So sit back, relax, and we will get on with the show. So Jason, welcome to uh, the Boost Hospitality podcast. Um, If you could please just take a couple of minutes and introduce you, uh, your business, and how you got started in service accommodation. Sure. Thanks very much, Mark. And uh, great to be here. Um, And uh, hello, everybody. Um, Yeah. So my background is very much from the property side. I qualified as a chartered surveyor um, sort of more years ago than I I care to remember, so early 1990s, and and worked uh, as a commercial planning consultant in London and uh, and had a a property there that I'd originally bought, then um, moved out of and rented out. And then I moved up to to Yorkshire and worked in the northeast from the sort of late 90s. And when I got there, I started buying um, investment property, residential property to, to let out and, and built that up to a, a pretty significant scale um, through the, the 2000s. And uh, as everybody now knows, you know, back in the 2007, 8, 9, you know, it all became rather difficult and we sort of scraped through by the skin of our teeth and, um, um, you know, really then set about I suppose climbing out of the hole we'd fallen into, and part of that was was really looking at the properties we'd got and and trying to trying to find ways of of maximising our return from those properties. And one of those that I became aware of was people letting property up on what was termed serviced accommodation. Now that is typically just taking a a, a residential rental property and letting it out on a shorter term basis. So typically, if you want to rent a property, you know most landlords or letting agents, it's six months minimum. You know, you've got to sign up and, and also it may well be unfurnished and you've got to pay the bills. A serviced accommodation is where um, you know, it's a much shorter period. Now, some people will, will do one night stays in our own properties. We do a minimum of, of two night stays um, and they're fully kitted out. They're fully furnished. Obviously, they've got Internet. All the, the bills are covered. Um, they've got crockery, cutlery, toaster, kettle. You know, all the same stuff you'd have in any self-catering property. You know, kitted out to quite a high standard, and and people come and stay for as long as they wish. You know, short stay, anything longer than a week, um, we will normally clean and you know refresh the linen and the towels, which is all provided um, on a on a weekly basis. So you know, we do get quite a lot of. Uh, broadly termed corporate guests so so people working in the area often contractors on on um, on construction projects you know and they might stay for two or three months and we go in and and sort of do a light clean and a, a refresh of everything um once a week so um so it's really self-catering accommodation but but not necessarily unlike a lot of the hospitality industry not necessarily in um either holiday or p- pure leisure destinations so these might be you know, city centre or even just generally urban areas, anywhere where people are going and, you know, working away from home. So our typical clientele would be people who might otherwise stay in budget hotels, certainly contractor and things, budget hotels, you know, smaller B&Bs, family establishments, those sort of things. So 
as I say, it's a bit of an intro to me and a bit of a lead into what serviced accommodation is all about, which, as I say, we've been doing with some of our properties for about five years now. And how many properties do you look after um, in, in, the, in, the, in the UK? So t- total properties, all of our rental stock is about 185, um, mostly in the northeast. We've got a couple in London and about a dozen in, in Merseyside. But the, the short stay stuff, the serviced accommodation is, is just in Sunderland where our office is. And we've got 18 flats or apartments um, that we use for, for serviced accommodation. I increasingly sort of... I verge towards calling it short stay accommodation because I think it's a more it's a more inclusive term I think I think service accommodation has particular connotations about it some people will say to you oh service accommodation is you know where that where it's being serviced every day sort of hotel style and there are no doubt sort of establishments of, of that nature in in larger cities so you know we probably sit somewhere between that and your typical self-catering accommodation where people are staying for a week or more because the uh, I think the general misconception and the assumption with serviced accommodation is that it is mostly contractors, business mm-hmm. people that are staying at these, but it's mm-hmm. not. It's um, you get holiday goers, you know, mm-hmm. who are also staying. You know, people that are just looking for two nights away. Uh, like I say, short stay accommodation. Where was the term serviced accommodation? first coined do you do you remember or is it just no i'm not sure i think it's one of those things that's been about for years and i think another misconception is this is something that has just happened in the last few years and and that's you know absolutely not the case you know i can remember staying in a a service department in london 30 years ago you know so so these this sort of short stay accommodation has has existed you know for a long time i just think i just think for a number of reasons it's it's perhaps come to the fore become more prominent you know, it's a significant growth area at the moment. But as you say, I think I think we have a very wide range of visitors, and that's often very much location driven. As I say, where where our own short stay accommodation is in Sunderland, um, yeah, we definitely get some leisure visitors, and that's whether they're coming for specific events such as the Sunderland Air Show, which is on in July, or um, you know, the Great North Run, which is on in September or people coming to visit family and friends or coming for a wedding or a christening or all that sort of stuff, you know, from those to, to people coming, as I say, working in the area on, uh, on, on contracts, either in you know, whether that's local factories, refitting shops, you know, bricklayers, building houses, all sorts. You name all it. Sorts. Yeah. So what has been the boom? in service accommodation like when i say service accommodation, i mean like short stay what is what was the catalyst for this so where you see now all over the country and in towns and cities you've got you've got people that are taking a residential home and uh changing it to short stay accommodation sure yeah i i, I think it's it's probably very difficult to pinpoint and i think I, th- I think it'd be right to say that, you know, there's there's never sort of one specific factor. I think it's a number of things. I think the I think the the, the rise of, of say Airbnb it, it is a significant factor. You know, that certainly kicked off the idea of people renting out a room in their home on a short stay basis. And and that business model has morphed into people letting you know, whole whole properties. You know, the origin of, of Airbnb was very much, you know, someone staying in your home. It, it's clearly it's clearly moved on from there. And I think you've then got the likes of Booking.com and the other typical platforms starting to embrace this. You know, Booking.com originally was very much a you know hotel platform. You know, now uh, you know they've embraced the idea that actually people are letting out you know residential properties. You know, when you do a search on there, there's a specific you know, apartment box you can tick. If you speak to the guys at booking.com, they have a, a whole department now called home, their home department. And I think, I can't remember, from something like three years ago, I mean, they went from sort of like two people to 20 people in about 12 months. You know, they they recognised, um, you know, the, the growth in that sector and the fact that it was a significant growth sector for them. Um, I think it's been partly driven from a looking at it from the property investment end. There were some changes to the tax rules, which... Um, sort of came in two years ago now um, about the ability to offset mortgage interest as a cost and the ability to do that within a standard rental property is now is now limited particularly for high rate taxpayers whereas if you're doing um, you know short stays that's effectively regarded as a as a business 
activity rather than investment activity and and you can offset all of your interests so there's a significant um, tax advantage in doing short lets versus uh, versus normal longer lets so i think there's i think there's been a series of things and then i think just with that a growing awareness i mean and i would class myself within that you know if i went to stay somewhere I, you know i'm in north yorkshire i typically might get down to london every couple of months in the past i would always have stayed in hotels now it depends you know i wouldn't always stay in service accommodation but it would certainly be on my radar and certainly if i was going with more than one person yeah. and i think that's the tipping point for me if i if i'm just going for a night on my own then you know um, business work just, or whatever yeah. yeah probably just probably just going to a hotel as soon as you've got two or three people you know where you can rent one apartment for those two or three people i just think service accommodation is yeah is just so much better so many advantages so um walk me through like the, the the simplicity of it so right now if you are a home owner and you were currently doing a long-term rent model where mm -hmm. you had tenants come in and stay for say mm -hmm. six months to a year mm -hmm. there's they now have got the ability to change it up um because of these new rules that have come in mm -hmm. and they can offer it as a as a short stay accommodation mm -hmm. you've also got people now that um can start up businesses uh, as management companies and then they can look after properties so they would approach a landlord or an estate agent and just say i want to potentially take on company of uh, a property that is for rent and turn it into a service accommodation and and and, and i have a short stay people come in like business people etc is, is is that how it is basically working or like explain to me the different types of service accommodation, explain the different types of, of businesses that are coming into this and, and which can sort of maybe explain why it is booming so much. Sure, I guess at the simplest level, you've got somebody who, who owns a property that they want to, to look at maximizing their income out of. And as you say, rather than doing you know, six month plus normal tenancies, they say, look, I, you know, I think there's a market here for doing short stays. So that's you know, the, the sort of owner operator if you like. I mean, yeah. the one thing I would say as a caveat to all of this, and it is a, a fantastic business, um, you know, to, to, to get into. And I think it has some, I think it has some real positives as a business. It's highly systemizable. You're dealing with an awful lot of repeat tasks, which means it's, it's very systemizable. You, know, you can write procedures for everything. It's very easy to outsource. But I would say, unless you're doing it at, at a certain scale and, you know, there's no no magic in the number but i always think about sort of doing you know 10 plus units unless you're aiming to get to that size you're probably never going to get the real economies of scale of enabling you to to sort of property out uh, properly outsource i think if you've got one rental property and you want to do that as short stay accommodation it's quite a lot of you know there's a lot of moving parts to this business Clearly, you've got people coming and going on a very regular basis you've got the cleaning to sort out you've got the linen to sort out you've got marketing to sort out you know you, you're going to be managing your prices there's a lot of moving parts and if you're doing that for one unit it's probably an awful lot of work for, for the extra income um, but you know not saying don't start with one but I think if you think you're just going to do one and only do one I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd question whether that, you know, that, that really, really makes sense. I think you've got to look to the scale. But coming back to your original question, so you've got your, your owner occupier doing it with, with their own properties. And a lot of people are getting into this market by, by renting properties from a landlord. It's typically terms sort of rent to rent or, uh, you know, I, I think I prefer the term leasing a property. So, so rather than you owning it, you will go to a landlord who's got a property to let and you will say, look, I will, I will be your tenant effectively. I will rent that property for, from you, but it's not going to be me or my company that's going to be living in it. I'm then going to be using that to accommodate guests. Um, you know short medium medium term guests and the great thing you know there's lots and lots of positives from a landlord point of view in the sense that you know provided that person knows what they're doing and they're generating the income then you know the rent should keep coming in it's not like that person like a tenant could lose their job you know and then they struggle to pay the rent you know, that that shouldn't happen um, as a as an operator of service accommodation, you're going to want to keep that property to a high standard. You know, you're probably going to want to typically go in every two or three months and touch up the paintwork and, you know, maybe thoroughly clean the carpets and all those sort of things, which is far better than any tenant will treat a landlord's property. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of a lot of positives around that. So that's another model, sort of renting or lease 
leasing and and you know if you look at hotels i mentioned travelodge earlier basically that's what travelodge do they don't own the buildings they operate in or in the vast majority of cases there'll be an investment company that owns that building they will lease it and then let out the rooms to their guests so on a much smaller scale that's that's what you're doing you're basically letting the property from a, an investor landlord you're acting as the operator and then you're getting the the guests in and, and and looking after those guests so that's one way of doing it leasing or as you mentioned you can manage you can approach landlords and say look rather than getting 600 pounds a month on a rent you know i think we could you know we could get an extra 300 pounds a month or we could get an extra 600 pounds a month and we'll then split that you know we'll take part half as the management fee um you know and you can take the other half as as extra profit um so again working with landlords to to maximize their profit you could either do that on a pure management basis where you say well we'll just charge your management fee which might typically be anything anywhere between sort of 15 and low 20 percent of the of the income for a for a fully managed so you might do a pure management model or you might do some sort of you know, part management part profit share sort of every every variation really you know it seems to be like lots of different variations of yeah, getting yeah. into this business but you yeah. can see I mean, fundamentally yeah i mean fundamentally it comes back to you whether you're acting as the owner operator leased operator management company effectively you're doing all the same work mm -hmm. it's just under a different type of thing yeah yeah exactly and and uh, you know there are various pros and cons with each of those different ways of doing things and uh, a question that has just come up whilst you've been talking is how easy is it to get started say that me never done it before mm -hmm. um this sounds really good um i want to get you know i want to start approaching landlords like how easy is it for me to get started is there any rules or regulations i have to go for any accreditation or can i just simply just start doing the research and get started now you know, it's surprisingly unregulated and whether that will whether that will continue in the same vein um you know i perhaps perhaps doubt you know i think i think regulation in some form um you know may well come and it's one of i think to some extent part of the hotel industry's gripe about the growth in this type of accommodation is is that they are subject to much greater regulation yeah. um you know you are obliged to undertake for instance a fire risk assessment but you know, there's no there's no strict certification of anything um, that that needs to go on. So from that point of view, yeah, it is you know it is relatively easy. And um, you know, in terms of approaching landlords, you know, some people I would say um, because you're approaching whether it's a land you know from a rent to rent leasing point of view, you're approaching the landlord, you're approaching a letting agent, and you're you're trying to sell them an idea that something that maybe they've got no understanding of and that can sometimes be a little bit challenging you know, some people find it you know easier than others just like i suppose any any sales job some people are, are more you know natural in terms of their their aptitude for, yeah. for selling i mean they're selling a, a concept rather than a rather than a product so but but in terms of as you say in terms of regulation in terms of barriers to entry really there aren't any and certainly when i got into this business um admittedly with properties we own but one of the things that struck me in terms of in terms of getting out there and, and marketing is because you can immediately jump on the likes of booking.com and airbnb you, know, you can start this with nil marketing budget because you only pay those guys when you get a booking mm -hmm. okay you do pay and it's a decent commission but uh, but to me I, I i hadn't got an issue with that because i hadn't got to you know day you know let's face it most businesses these days before you even open the doors you've got to have a website you've got to think about your digital marketing and your you know more traditional marketing you know you've whereas with this you can start day one and just as your first step get it on airbnb and booking.com and i'm not saying that's where your business starts and ends but you can you can start you know with you know with very little capital yeah um you know just, yes just get it on course, and get going yeah of course you then want to build on that and and have a website and you know do other marketing and and those sort of things but it's not say perhaps unlike other businesses and that's when they come to boostly and that's when they come get a website i know that's that's, that's what <laughs> all yeah. right so um next thing then that i'm really interested to know is that if people do jump on this you know mm -hmm. there's no accreditation there's, there's no regulation that they literally do jump in they um do a bit of research and they get started what is the most common mistake that you mm -hmm. see people making in the industry when they're getting going 
there's a number to be honest um i think one of them is probably um depending on what their background is i think if people have come from the hospitality side then uh, they probably I don't make some of these mistakes but one of the big mistakes particularly coming from the property side is not not understanding that um uh, that you need to actively manage your pricing you know your pr pricing should be very dynamic and the easiest way to explain that to people because everyone understands it is um is you know the easy jet model you know, easy jet easy easy jet launch a flight in november and the you know and you can get on that flight for 30 quid um but that price gets actively managed and you know and if if they launch that flight in august it won't be 30 quid to start with anyway um so there's a seasonality to it but but you know they I mean, they basically run um a sort of two pricing models but they they basically run an occupancy pricing model so basically they have thresholds that when five seats get sold the price goes up five quid another five seats get sold it goes up another five quid and 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 so you go on so unlike a sort of rental property where it's 600 pounds a month and that's what it is mm. you know you'll have you know you might have and typically you would have you know different different prices for almost even every day of the week you know, typically within the hospitality industry, Sunday is always your quietest night. So if you're pricing by the night, you know, Sunday needs to be your cheapest night. Mm -hmm. Typically, Friday and Saturday are probably your busiest nights. But equally, there are locations where your midweek market is stronger than your weekend market. And you've got, so you've got to know your market. Yeah. You know, your Monday might be one price, Tuesday might be a bit more. So it's that initial pricing is, you know, you don't just say, right, it's £70 a night across every day of the week every month of the year you know you've yeah. got a different price for every day of the week and then what you've got to do is constantly review those prices you know i would say probably at least every week to see you know what's the demand in the area what are my competitors doing you know are they yeah you know, and and whilst if you like you're not directly competing with the travel lodge down the road they're a useful indicator because you know if they start putting their price up it's because they've seen an increase in demand now you may not have seen that increase in demand yet but you can pretty much guarantee if they have you will so you can afford to start pushing your prices up even before the demand hits yeah so that whole dynamic pricing thing is, is something that's as I say, particularly if people come from the property investment side is something that's that's sort of wholly new I guess um, if there's a service accommodation owner who's listening to this and thinking, well, how do I even get started in that? One of the simplest things that you can do is look at your calendar, go on, say Sunderland, go yeah. to what's on in Sunderland and just box off the next three months or six months and just look for any big events, any concerts, anything that's big that's come into town. Uh, the example in the story that I can give you from a hospitality point of view is um, based in Scarborough. My family business um, has got a farm stay hotel guest house cottages here in Scarborough. In 2018, we had Britney Spears play in Scarborough and it was announced in January and the event and the concert was sold out pretty much within 24 hours. So being a bit proactive, you go on, you instantly close out any dates to the online travel agents via your channel manager. So whether you're using Tokit or free to book or whoever, so that's totally blocked off the dates on there. So you're guaranteed to get your direct booking. And then what you do is you put the rates up because you know that when that get announced, there's, there's two things that people do. They book the tickets and they look for accommodation. And if you're savvy and if you've got a good presence then people will naturally come to your website and book with you, and then all you need to do is just, again, like what Jason is saying, assess it every week or every month. And the closer it gets to the date, if you've still got availability for those dates, you just start to slowly put the, the price back down to what your normal rate is. And then you start to open it back up to the OTA. So like Jason said right at the very start, make these booking.com make Airbnb work for you and not the other way around. So if you have got anything that needs selling last minute, Put up on those and i can guarantee that you will get those booking so that is exactly it um and, and we, we we sold out like for those dates um pretty much within 48 72 hours and this was in january the concert was in august money in the bank guaranteed bookings coming in and we we, we were able to manipulate the market you know assess with the market so that's 
hundred percent something that everybody should be doing. And it's, and it's, um, and I think, you know, if you're a service accommodation owner, definitely looking at your pricing is, is one. But those, those things can make a huge difference. And again, to, to use a similar example, we had the Spice Girls in Sunderland in, in early June this year. We did exactly that. As soon as we heard, we just blocked the calendar off. And then we, uh, we don't normally do one night stays. We knew there would be a demand for one night stays. Get, you know, and the reason we don't is because obviously you've still got your fixed cleaning linen turnaround costs. And it, it generally makes, apart from the fact one night stays are a bit of a pain in the neck, you know, it makes it, it, it your profit margin is much thinner on a one night stay. So, but, but knowing that we would get premium prices for those nights or for that night, you know, we opened up our calendar for, for, for one night stays. And I think they, you know, we were getting, so I think the best week, so, and as we got booked, as we put each time we got an apartment, but we just put the price up on the whole lot. Every, every time a booking came in, we just pushed the price up again. And I think we got up to, for a, for an apartment that we might normally get something between say 60 and 80 pounds a night we were getting 275 pounds a night for that well, that's it you've, you've covered your and yeah. that's, like i say and, and where you're thinking oh i've got to do a one night stay but realistically what you've just got is a five night booking for the price of one yeah absolutely and, and you can get somebody in the next night who's going to then stay you know two two nights so it's uh it's again it's, it's a case of not just looking at the singularity not just looking at it as a singular event, looking at an overall series of events. And as I say, it just, it just makes so much sense. So if you're being proactive over it instead of reactive, then, then yeah, you'll, you'll win. You said there's, there's a number of mistakes that you see people make. What's maybe one of the other ones that's on top of your mind, apart from pricing and, and knowing your market? Yeah, so pricing is, is, is a big one. There was one I was thinking of, and it slipped my mind now. We uh, got stuck into pricing. You said about knowing the markets. So of to me, that's yeah. doing your planning and your preparation. Is that sort of what you meant alongside that? Yeah, I, I, I guess so. I, well, I guess the other, the other thing actually is very much feeds into the marketing side. As I said, you know, starting as a sort of first port of call, Booking.com, Airbnb, you know, will will get you a, a level of bookings. I think where people make a mistake is that they think they can completely rely on those you know, for, for all of their business, you know, and they're going to consistently get 70, 80, 90% occupancy just from being on those, on those, um, on those platforms, on those o OTAs. And, you know, it's not the case as you know, most markets are, you know, competitive market, you know, you've got to start to go above and beyond and they will give you a base of business, but you've got to get out there and whether that's direct marketing, you know, to, to, to local corporates, whether that's, you know, online marketing, website, digital marketing, email marketing, all the things that, that you talk so much about. Um, and, and again, I guess, because um, certainly from the property side, those are things that, that you wouldn't normally have to do. Yeah, you have to do some marketing to letter property, but you might just give it to a letting agent or you might just stick it on Rightmove yeah. you know, and Gumtree and the chances are that will, that will get you your letting. Um, but, you know, with service accommodation, you're, you're constantly trying to, as with any business, squeeze the margins. You know, so the difference between, you know, being 70% occupied and 80% you know, prob might mean you're doubling your profit. Yeah, hundred percent. And like I say, if you can, if and we spoke about this before we came live on the call, if you know you you build your your house on somebody else's land, it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, if you just rely a hundred percent on Booking dot com and Airbnb, but what happens if they turn around one day and close your account? For mm -hmm. Yeah, the simplest of things, and then you're stuck. And yeah, so it's always good to be, like you say, being proactive, um, trying to increase your amount of direct bookings because at the end of the day, you're instantly making at least 15% more money, mm -hmm. uh, more profit. Which over a singular booking may not seem all that much, but if you base it over a year, that's uh, that's a hell of a number. All right, so we, we, yeah. we've um, coming back to the mistakes. I remember what I was going to say now. Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. So, so I think a lot of people get into this and, and, and I think and this is interesting because I think it may e equally apply to other areas of the, of the hospitality industry. And I think people look sometimes at their operational side far too much from their own perspective in terms of what suits them, in terms of when do I want people to check in and out, you know, when you know, non-refundables, deposits, cancellation periods, you know, because in an ideal world from an, from a, you know, from an operator point of view, you'd want everybody paying 100% when they book, you'd want them paying a deposit, you want them all turning up between three and four in the afternoon, 
and all leaving between you know 10 30 11 30 in the morning but you, you know if, if if that's the way you approach your business then effectively what you're doing is you're, you're massively constraining your demand because if your property sat alongside three others and someone's looking at yours and it says you can only check in between three and four in the afternoon and someone says well what if we're late Mm-hmm. You know, and I know that's a slightly extreme example, but you do see examples of of significant constraints. You know, where, as I say, where you know all all rates are non-refundable. You know, so I want to book somewhere in six months, so I've got to pay now, and you're just going to sit on my money. Yeah. Um, you know, so so I th- I think that's a mistake where people look at it, and the way it's been described is, to me is you know you need to look at your business from the outside in, i.e., from the guest perspective. Whereas too many people, I think, look at their business from the inside out mm-hmm. and say, I'm going to run my business to suit me rather than actually thinking about the, the, the whole guest experience. And, and Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great bit of advice that I think so many people overlook. But at the end of the day, if you're not appealable to your guests, then they're never going to come back and they're never going to talk about you. Mm-hmm. But if you make your business and you base it around your guests and you suit it around your guests and you, and you develop a system and structure where it does meet your guests, then they are going to recommend you. They are going to come back and they're going to be your best customers. I mean, one of the biggest mistakes that I see hospitality owners, service accommodation owners, business owners in general, is they're always looking for new customers. When if they Mm. just spade a, a bit of attention to the people that have already given them money that have already built up that no like and trust then you could make much more money and have much better guests and there's a, a, a fantastic blog everybody should go read it's a thousand true fans by kevin kelly uh, it's a free blog you can go out and find it look at it on google and it, it's a it's a prime example that somebody should be looking at into their business every single time yeah all right so um We've talked about common mistakes and I think as, as you know, I know everybody that is listening to this who is in the SA world is there is a lot of advice given mm-hmm. at the moment. There's obviously with this becoming a booming industry and more and more people are getting into it. There is of course loads of people that are starting to give advice. There's lots of people that have started up mentoring in, in this industry. There's a lot of people that, have, that are basically saying, I've done this now, follow my advice. A lot of it is good advice. A lot of it is is bad advice. But what is the one bit of advice that you've seen in the industry that you don't agree with? Mm-hmm. What what would that be? I guess I guess some of the some of the bad advice around around planning about planning use classes mm-hmm. um, because basically a residential property to get into sort of a bit of geeky planning is 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 use class C three. And, and use class C1 is hotels, um, guest houses, and boarding houses, technically, which obviously includes B&Bs and, and sort of similar establishments. Now, there are people who are going around saying that that uh, to run a, let's say, just a bog standard house, as uh, letting it as a whole house to a family, that you require C1 planning consent. But absolutely, you don't. You know, it's not a hotel um, guest house or, or, or boarding house quite clearly and and I would say to people you know most holiday accommodation it's it's just a standard residential use class mm. um, there have been a couple of planning appeal decisions which uh, I, I think are questionable which start to go down the route of saying well if you've got different people staying there every night have you not materially changed that use in planning in terms still doesn't make it a hotel or c1 it, it then strays into a use class of its own which again to get a bit geeky something that's called sui generis which means a use class on its own I, I i don't believe um so it's difficult because there have been a couple of appeal decisions but they're not they're not court decisions they're not legally binding you know it can only be used as sort of advice or indicative advice on other things um but certainly when i first got in there were a lot of people saying oh you know it needed to be c1 or in order in order to um put your property on business rates it needs to be c1 i mean that's just total nonsense um any any property that's let for short lets commercially for more than 140 days a year um should be on business rates 
you know, most holiday accommodation, assuming it's being commercially let rather than just, you know, occupied as a second home, you know, it should be on business rates. There's another big tax advantage called capital allowances, which hopefully people in the more commercial world, the B&Bs, the hotels, pubs of this world, you know, should know something about that. And if, if they don't, I'd encourage them to go and find out about capital allowances because it may, it may actually significantly reduce your tax bill. Certainly if you've bought a property or renovated your property at, at all, then then go and find out something about capital allowances. Um, and again, you don't need to, as a as a, uh, a short stay operator of a residential property, it does not need to be C1 to claim capital allowances. So that, you know, there's, there's a lot of bad advice around that. Yeah, definitely. And I can see, I can see why so many people would fall for it because as soon as you started saying those letters to me, my head just glazed over with what? <laughs> yes. So I can see that if you get somebody mm. that is up there on the stage or, you know, in a mm. horse that you're a part of and it's saying that, then you know, you, mm. you're going to do that. So thanks for sharing that. I mean, personally for me, uh, from what I've seen and I've researched into service accommodation, rent to rent, whatever you want to call it, I think there's so many people who are getting into this industry under the false pretenses because they get told uh, this this magical word passive income and they get sold the dream. Uh, and I've heard this from from a lot of people is that um, they're basically being put down this route by saying that when you do this, when you um, open up the doors and you get your first rental, you whack it up on Airbnb, whack it up on booking.com and that's it. Your job's done. You're going to be making a grand a month or whatever it may be. And I think, I think for a lot of people, um, they have to realize that this is the, probably one of the most stressful jobs that you are going to have. Cause there's like you said, so many moving parts. You've got to a get people through the door. Then you've got to then start looking after your guests. And then once the guest leaves, you've then got to sort out the clean, the changeover to get ready for the next guest. And there's so many things that change and alter and the things that could go wrong do go wrong. And you've got one property. Just imagine when you build up and you've got two or three or four. Now it's not like a hotel or a guest house where you've got 14 bedrooms in one property and all you have to do is go up and down stairs. Imagine if you've got four or five properties spread out around Sunderland or around town and you've got to literally get in your car 10 o'clock at night because you, you know, you, for whatever reason, you've got to get across town to fix something because you haven't got the systems and the structure and that lot built up. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing that, that, that I've noticed in place. Say, but there's so much advice out there that you just got to be really careful that you make sure that you are working with or working alongside or investing in somebody that, that knows what they're talking yeah. about, which does lead in nicely to what you do. So, you know, you've got your background, you've done this for many years, you've built a big portfolio, you're looking after over 150 properties, um, which is amazing. So what are you doing now? moving forward to help the industry help SA help people who want to get into SA sure well um, for a while now I've 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 held um, various uh, sort of events for people to come to but we have slightly sort of moved on from there because what I found is with those events you know it's, it's an awful lot of time and effort to, um, to to put them on and also people have got a you know there's obviously a cost for people to attend which is related to the cost of putting them on people have got to travel they've maybe got to take a day out of their their week to, to come to that event and you know and all of those things are, are a constraint so and I thought it'd be far better to try to help people you know online in a way that, that they can access that when they want to that works for them so you know they can catch an hour early morning evening whatever so so i recently launched the short stay living academy um, which is an online membership platform and and each month what we do is we have a uh, a, a guest an expert guest and mark's been our most recently get recent guest talking about marketing um so we've had a guest on talking about working with letting agents and landlords. We've got a guest coming on next month talking about the whole, you know, pricing thing I was talking about and how to how to to manage your prices. So an expert focus each each month, um, and and we do live Q and As with those experts so people can you know digest the content, digest the information, come back and ask questions. And you know my whole focus with that really is to give people. Um, you know, massively valuable but implementable information you know for a relatively low monthly cost 
you know, compared with a lot of the sort of big, um, you know, headline courses out there, you know, we're talking, you know, a, a much, much smaller level of, of investment. Now, off the back of that, what I want to do, particularly for people who really want to get started and really want, um, you know, a, a lot of information, the sort of A to Z, you know, we will be launching an online course, you know, alongside or as part of the Short Stay Living Academy. Um, and, and hopefully that should be launched by the end of the month, so not end of the, end of the summer. Um, you know, there's a lot of information to, to pull together to, to launch that. Again, really to give people, you know, real nuts and bolts as to, as to how to launch and run and, and scale a serviced accommodation business. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, to be honest, like you, I just really enjoy helping people and seeing, you know, the results that those people can, can achieve, you know, with, with the right help and support and knowledge. That's, that's amazing. That's really good. So, um, if you're listening to this, um, in say September or October, 2019, because the beauty of podcasts is that it is evergreen and it sits there forever. So if you're watching this, this is being recorded in June 2019, so if you're listening back in October 2019, you can already head to what Jason is talking about uh, and be able to sign up. So if they want to go and find out more about you, more about the uh, SSL, more about anything really to do with yourself, where's the best place for people to head to, Jason? Probably the best starting point is I've got a Facebook group, a serviced accommodation group on Facebook, which is fantastic. Got nearly 10,000 people there called the Serviced Accommodation Network UK. What I'd encourage people to do is come along and join that. That's free. Um, and, and there's some really, really helpful people on there. What I would encourage people to do rather than just launch in and say, because you, you get people coming on and their first question is, how do I run a serviced accommodation business? And what I would say to people is, look, just spend some time trawling through because there's an awful lot of information on here and then come back with some specific questions so that's a that's a free starting point but from from that um you know please come on and ask questions and you know, we talk about the uh, the short stay living uh, academy on there and and put forward various offers people will get an offer when when they join um the 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 free group to come on board um, for the academy and and I'm you know if you can contact me Jason Living on Facebook via Facebook Messenger that's probably the um, that's probably the easiest way and that, yeah. you know I'll certainly do everything I can to help. So you're on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, most play yeah. platforms. If they just type in uh, Jason Living Property um, yeah. Service Accommodation, I'm sure they'll be able to find you. Thank you very much Absolutely. for coming on and talking about that. And, and hopefully by okay. now, if anybody's never heard of Service Accommodation, they have a better idea of this and moving forward. And, and like you say, if you want to get started, uh, the best place to do it is the Service Accommodation Network. Is it UK? UK, yeah. Yeah. Because there are, if you type in service accommodation in Facebook, there is a lot you're going to get presented with. So it's Service Accommodation Network UK. Just look for, for Jason. Um, and he's the admin of the group. And yeah, that's a perfect place to start and then to find out more about the SSL as well. All right. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much for tuning in to uh, the Boost Hospitality Podcast. This is season six, episode one. If this is the first time that you have listened to one of my podcasts you've got five seasons that you can now catch up on go to boostly.co.uk forward slash podcast uh, we've done so many different variations of seasons from how to run the perfect facebook competition to explain about uh, what hospitality owners are doing on a day-to-day -day basis to boost their bookings uh, and also as well just breaking down some other jargons and the myths and showing you five steps that you can take to boost your direct bookings today but my name is Ben Maximson uh, founder of Boostly if you want to go find out more, go to booster.co.uk. And if you'd like to leave a review, please head over to iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast and leave one of those lovely five-star reviews for us. But thank you very much for tuning in and we will catch you for another episode of the Boost Hospitality Podcast very soon.